So welcome, Mateo. You probably know just about everything on this presentation, but uh, hopefully it'll help you with your uh, deliverables for the film your project section of the SCAD startup. Um, so again, these are a lot of the basics. These are the essential controls. You have the aperture, your ISO, focus, and white balance. Of course, aperture and ISO are two components that determine your exposure, which is how bright or dark your image is as it is exposed to light. So ISO, short for International Standard Organization, is your uh, sensor's sensitivity to light. Um, so if the number is low, it's much less sensitive. If it's high, it's much more sensitive. Um, aperture actually is in dealing with the lens. Um, it's the certain blades that are inside your lens element, which open up and close down depending how much light you want uh, fractionally within your image to be uh, exposing the sensor. So an example of a really small aperture like f uh, 1.9 f2 most lenses if they're not super fast will go down to that and not much lower. Um, that's about wide open, which exposes the most amount of light, and a lens that's about f16 to f22, that's all the way closed, allowing a minimal amount of light into it. Um, aperture is also a good tool for um, determining your depth of field, so a much wider or a uh, more open f-stop will give you a much shallower depth of field. The uh, higher f-stop will give you a much more expansive deep depth of field. Um, oh, we got another in the waiting room. Let's see. Welcome, D. We're just going over some basics. Um, But of course, um, your depth of field will determine how carefully you need to focus. Um, again, for like phone cameras, it's pretty easy. The computer does it for you for a lot. You can just tap on it. But for a manual lens, you'll really need to get super precise if you have a low depth of field, you know, um, which would generally be the case if you're shooting um, product photography and videography. You don't want too much of the background uh, getting busy or really distracting your viewers. So you'll want you know, a tighter shot of it giving you primarily just the product. And white balance also you know, a great determiner of mood depending on what you're balanced for. So say you have some light mixing uh, white balance is essentially determined by the Kelvin temperature of the light, and you'll calibrate your camera to that. So incandescent light, which is tungsten, most of the lights in here, except for the fluorescence, are at around 3200 degrees Kelvin, which will appear much more orange. Uh, fluorescent light appears green on the sensor, which you know, there's not much calibration for that, but it's you can certainly color correct out of that. Um, daylight is at around 5600 degrees Kelvin to 6000 degrees Kelvin generally, and that registers much bluer on the spectrum of light. So again, those are determiners of mood. You can also calibrate it so that appears like a neutral white. Um, which is what I recommend most of the time, so you don't get strange colors that you have to correct for in post. So here is a good picture of aperture with, at the first picture, it's probably wide open or close to wide open with a really shallow depth of field that is about probably in the middle maybe a medium aperture of around 8 to 11, which will give you kind of a moderate depth of field. 
and then you have probably closer to F16 to F22, which will give you a much deeper depth of field again. And focus, this is probably done with the telephoto lens with a really kind of low aperture, which means they definitely had to nail that exposure and focus to get something really crisp there. ISO, it's just sensitivity. Uh, most phone cameras, you don't really need to worry about ISO. It's variable when it exposes. Um, phones, they go up most of the time in like 6,000 ISO, like something crazy. So you don't have to worry about much of anything. And they are also generally at around an aperture of like 1.9 or even higher. White balance, we went over. Um, and this is a great website. It's kind of like a simulator and a calculator for determining your exposure. If you want to visit that, it's really great. It shows you how many different variables will affect your exposure and kind of how the image looks. One thing we didn't go over earlier was shutter speed, which, you know, it's pretty intuitive if you have one sixtieth of a second that's just that amount of that fraction of time that the sensor is exposed to light the lower end will give you a much brighter picture but it will also involve much more camera shake if you don't have it on a tripod so it'll give you a motion blur as more time is required for that exposure making any slight movement blur the image so it's generally a good idea especially in still photography to shoot with higher shutter speeds unless you're going for something more stylized or you require that amount of time for your exposure uh, in videography a standard is 1 50th of a second which if you translate it to shutter angle, which is, you don't really need to, but that's a classic in uh, film, it's about 180 degree shutter angle. And that's just how much the light is exposing based off of the uh, shutter speed. And 1 50th is a standard, it's used along with either 30 frames or 24 frames and has been used for decades as a standard for motion media. Um, but again, that's a great little website for determining all the different aspects. If you just want to play with that, it's a lot of fun. Okay, lensing, my favorite. You can never go wrong with looking at different lenses. Um, on our far left, we have ultra wides, which are great for having a deep depth of field. They show you a lot of the uh, setting that you would be in. They are interesting in that they distort space around them because they have such a wide shutter angle. Well, not shutter angle, but uh, lens angle, which is how much the actual sensor is allowed to see proportional to where the lens is positioned. A normal wide, or also known as a standard lens, which is about 35 to 50 millimeters, that's approximately what eyesight is. It'll give you something really, really close to what your eye would actually see. Of course, it's confined to a certain set frame within a camera. And telephoto, which is really the money shot lens, it's great for portraiture, it's great for product photography. It gets all of the unnecessary stuff out of the way. It has a shallow depth of field, more so. And it allows you to get really close to your subject without having to move closer. It's the binoculars of the lens world. And that's really wide to telephoto is kind of like the golden range for product videography. Because, you know, most people, they don't really want to see something grotesque and super wide, uh, especially in terms of products. You want it to be as close to eye le level 
or kind of contracted in space to where it's just around that object. So that's a something to keep in mind. And there we go. Of course, we have the strong sense of scale with wides. They're good for establishing and they distort closer objects than normal. And our telephoto, which is you know great for emotional con connection and portraiture. And some pro tools, again, not necessary. You really don't need it, but you know, if you have it already or you can make your own, it'll really set you a cut above. I have made my own lights before. I've jury rigged some stuff. You can actually just get a normal desk lamp. You can line it with tin foil and it creates a really great uh, reflector, which intensifies the light that's coming out of that lens. You can even put more tin foil on it, which for that far right image is barn doors, which allows you to shape light. It closes off certain areas so it doesn't hit. And you can really use just about anything. The film industry likes to professionalize a lot of random junk that they find, especially for lighting. You can use um, white uh, cardstock, white foam board as a bounce, which allows you to soften your light and decrease intensity. You have silks and stuff, which can go over or in front of a light, which also diffuses it and makes it much softer. Actually, um, in my hometown, me and my friends did two lights because we needed for a shooting video. And we, did, we took the like, huge stadium lamp mm -hmm. and we just put like four LEDs mm -hmm. on it and it was awesome. Yeah. yeah. It sounded like it's yeah. great. Um, but for a lot of studio lighting, which is good for product photography and videography, um, you'll generally have, you know, fairly professional light setups like ellipsoidal uh, lights, which you really don't need to worry about. But a lot of the light is not super harsh. It's fairly soft and diffused, so you don't get harsh shadows unless that's something stylistically you want. Um, but most of the time, it's trying to envelop the full subject and give it a really pleasing kind of diffused look to it. And gels, in addition to white balance, those are other tools for um, coloring light, uh, color correcting it so that it has the desired effect or color that you're going for. Okay, so for you, we have a product video activity. So I guess without further ado, we will show you this little video that we cooked up as kind of an initial prompter, and then we'll give you a product to video. All right, and so now you'll have around 15 seconds to make this glorious solo cup beautiful and to sell it. Hey guys, uh, Quentin from the future here, and I just wanted to give you a couple tips on making your vision videos when you do that. Uh, this kind of short form video about a product and its features is often called a vision video. Uh, so if you want some more tips, feel free to Google that. Um, it's exactly like it sounds vision as in like the thing that you see and then a video like the thing that you're making. And when you're going into this, you can kind of think of it as a uh, product pitch or uh, like if you've ever been on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or something like that and they have a couple, uh, you know, videos about like how their product works and um, what it does and, and what features it has trying to get you to invest in it. That's kind of the thing that we're looking for here. Uh, you can also look at Shark Tank and you can look at some of those things. It's a very similar pitch. Uh, you just have 30 seconds for your video uh, that you need to make. And so me and Isaac came up with a couple different uh, criteria that you should try to look for uh, when you're doing this. And I'll kind of explain each one of them. Uh, I have them on the word behind me here. So um, the first one being show, don't tell. 
Um, if you can avoid like explicitly telling the audience something, uh, try to avoid doing that. It's a lot more powerful if you were able to kind of show somebody using your app or someone using your solution as opposed to telling them, you know, like 40 percent of Americans have an issue with blank. Um, it's a lot easier to show someone having an issue with the thing and um, showing them go through that frustration. So show don't tell is the probably the biggest one. Uh, always put your screens in context. And so uh, when you do show a screenshot or you show like a screen flow or something like that, it's always better to you know show it on a background of someone using a phone um, just so that they have some kind of context of where that person is going to be. Even if you blur it out or you don't really use the footage as much, um, it's important to have that screen in some kind of context as opposed to just you know a, a screen in the center of the frame. Uh, it'll just you know help people understand what that feature is doing a lot better. And then more important than everything else, we want to connect emotionally with that audience. Um, you know, something sentimental at the end is really powerful to get like that lasting like emotion with someone. Um, that's probably actually more important than showing off the features of your solution, uh, especially for something like this on Instagram where you're going to have people uh, liking it uh, and stuff like that. Um, you know, what's that thing that's going to make someone connect emotionally with your solution? Maybe. You know, making something for children and this child has trouble communicating with their friends and so maybe at the end you show them using your product to communicate effectively with a friend and they've uh, they've made a new friend or something like that um, try to connect emotionally with that audience so um, that is my advice for doing vision videos they don't have to be fantastically well produced or for, uh, fantastically well filmed you can do it on a phone and put it together in iMovie if you want it's not uh, something that's super important in terms of like actual quality, but uh, it's that emotional connection and that show don't tell that really pushes it to the next level. So best of luck, everyone. And uh, I guess I'll see everybody's vision videos on the Instagram.